And there are a number of considerations that have led many scholars to conclude that Luke 1 and 2 were not written by the author of the rest of the Gospel of Luke, but were added later to the Gospel of Luke. To begin, the Greek of Luke 1 and 2 is markedly distinct from the Greek of the rest of the Gospel of Luke, and scholars have noted that for a long time. Okay, so in Luke 1 and 2, there are 132 verses. 26 of those verses include the Magnificat, the Song of Zechariah, and the Song of Simeon. Could these various canticles explain some of the Greek differences that we find in the first two chapters of Luke? Also, the difference in language could be very easily chalked up to the fact that Luke just is using different source material in chapters 1 verses 2. We know that he sticks pretty close to Mark's verbiage overall for much of his gospel, and we do know that Luke was a traveling companion of Paul, and he would have had access to James according to Acts chapter 21, and he could have easily got some material about Jesus' early life from Jesus' own brother. And so I don't think this is really all that big of a mystery. But also the main themes of the Nativity account, Jesus being born of a virgin, Jesus coming from Bethlehem, these things never pop back up later in the Gospel of Luke, even though other things from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, like his baptism, are referenced later in the Gospel of Luke. Okay, so now we're arguing from the silence of chapter 3 through 24 that the virgin birth is a later addition because Luke doesn't repeat the story of the virgin birth throughout the rest of his gospel. Does Matthew do this after chapter 2? I don't think so. Also, what words regarding Jesus' baptism is Dan referring to in the later chapters of Luke? There's a mention of John the Baptist and him baptizing in chapter 7. And in chapter 9 on the Mount of Transfiguration, we do hear some similar words being spoken over Jesus that were at his baptism. But I don't understand what Dan is talking about here. How are we building an entire theory based on just these meager scraps? Also, contradicting Dan, New Testament scholar James Edwards notes, verbally, the infancy narrative in Luke and the body of the gospel are strongly knit together. Paul Menier provides a list of 55 words or phrases which appear both in the birth narratives and in the rest of Luke Acts, and which are found more often in these two books than in the rest of the New Testament. Henry Cadbury cites six phrases in Luke 1 and 2 that reappear either verbatim or nearly verbatim in the remainder of Luke Acts. Most important, Joachim Jeremias devotes one-third of his meticulous examination of the vocabulary of Luke to the vocabulary of chapters 1 and 2 and the influence of that vocabulary on the remainder of the gospel. So McClellan's theory faces serious opposition from other scholars and for good reason. References to Jesus' family like Joseph, and Mary clearly echo themes from Luke 1 and 2, indicating a deliberate and essential connection between their roles in Jesus' life during his childhood and later years. But let's play detective here. Take out Luke 1 and 2, and a significant gap appears in the narrative. Later in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 19 through 21, Mary's there without a name tag, yet in Acts 1.14, her name is in lights. It practically screams that she was a prominent figure in the gospel, probably in Luke chapter 1 through 2. Removing these chapters throws the whole storyline out of whack. McClellan's scholarly theory seems shaky when you consider these crucial puzzle pieces. Luke chapter 3 also begins how we would expect a story like this to begin, by setting the scene, what's called a synchronism. Uh, that's how Luke's source material, the Gospel of Mark, begins their account, setting the scene, describing Jesus' baptism. Now Luke then goes into the genealogy, which makes sense if the whole story is beginning with the baptism, because you've got to catch the audience up. you got to say, by the way, this is where Jesus is coming from. But we've already had two chapters discussing the conception and birth of both John the Baptist and Jesus. And then we're fast forwarding 30 years to his baptism. And then we're going to go back and say, by the way, here's where he came from. That doesn't make as much sense as the story beginning with Luke chapter 3. So because of this and some other considerations of a more technical nature, there are a lot of scholars who think that Luke chapters 1 and 2 were actually secondarily added to the rest of the Gospel of Luke. I mean, I suppose that the genealogy is in slightly a weird spot, but what does this really indicate other than Luke is just a tad bit disorganized? Furthermore, the genealogy itself subtly refers to the unique circumstances of Jesus' birth, reading being as was supposed, the son of Joseph, in Luke 3.23. Also, the way Jesus was brought up in Nazareth is also included in the infancy stories, and Luke reaffirms that later in the Gospel and Acts. 
Luke seems to be purposely keeping things connected, bridging Jesus' childhood to his grown-up life, so I just don't see a major problem here. There's also the fact that there's not a shred of manuscript evidence backing up this theory, and there's no external attestation of it in the early church fathers. Justin Martyr, writing in the early 2nd century, refers to Luke 1 through 2 more than once, but he doesn't seem to be aware of this story being a later edition. Also, let's think about Zechariah's song for just a moment. After the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, would anybody fabricate the words salvation from our enemies and attribute them to being what the forerunner of Jesus would accomplish? Not really likely. The Romans sacked Jerusalem, they enslaved many, they destroyed the sacrificial system, and tore down the temple and crucified scores. Putting a statement like salvation from our enemies in Luke 171 would only highlight the failure if it didn't pan out. These are just not words that a later author would add to the story in say 90 to 120 AD in order to enhance the narrative. And so I think when Dan floats particular speculative theories like this, it just kind of undermines the credibility of biblical scholarship. Mm -hmm.